Guys, uh, so a few people asking when I'm next in the Philippines, or oh, that I've just arrived back. Uh, the answer to that is, I have no idea right now. Um, what we have at the minute is I'm sitting working out where I'm going from today, um, as in the next couple of years. We've got a few things on the table that I'm very interested in doing. First thing is on my right, which you can't see, is my other monitor. Uh, but I need to get into programming a lot more. And the thing is, I'm well aware if I go into programming, I'll be shutting myself down for about a month while I absorb as much information as possible. Um, because I can't be distracted when I'm on that. Um, Robert Dayton, a friend of mine, he's, he knows what I'm like when I get into the Linux stuff. Um, like with the old... <laughs> telephone exchange stuff, I taught myself in a month. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot of stuff. I'm sitting here writing for things that I see massive potential to make money on. Um, I know Robert Dayton's got some very, very good software. It's one of the things I was chatting to him about. I don't really want to talk about it too much, um, but he's got into parallel processing and stuff, and it's, it's, it's good stuff. I mean, also his data storage and the way it works um, to the point that he doesn't need hard drives in any of the machines anymore. Um, but like I said, I don't really discuss his stuff too much because it's his stuff, and I don't know how much he wants me to talk about it. Um, but it was good to sit and have a chat with somebody on a technical level because we understand software in different ways because he's a very very good uh, programming guy very switched on um, knows what he's doing and he loves it um, at the same time I know myself I've got a little bit settled into, into the Spanish life I've been making some reasonable money so I've not been in a rush to do anything and I think it's time to step things up a little one of the things I do recognize is with the blockchain technology, um, a lot of people as assume blockchain is Bitcoin, it's not. Um, let's just call it let's just call it blockchain technology so we can push all the cryptocurrency stuff to one side. I see some huge potential in some of the stuff that I normally work in that is obsolete. It was written in the 90s. A lot of the stuff I end up doing through Excel and other bits of um, patchwork. <laughs> Um, to accommodate the fact that their software is obsolete. Um, I think I could recode everything in Linux and come up with a much faster, more efficient and more stable system. But also by building the ledgers, um, which will come from the blockchain side. It will also allow um, the tracking of everything. And all right, I'll go into a little bit. I imagine Glenfell Fire was one of the ones that was a bit of an epiphany moment for me. Glenfell Fire, they installed external cladding uh, that wasn't fit for purpose for the building. Now, if you turn around and put this into a ledger system that identified that this was going above X amount of floors. So the cladding is specified for the number of floors. So when you actually go to put it into the computer system for a payment, it recognizes it's going to say 22 floors. It won't authorize the payment because it knows the cladding is only designed for up to first floor, for example. Um, so it will not authorize the payment. Now, why is that relevant? In local authority, a lot of people are not qualified or skilled in the jobs they're in. It's why I spend years going around fixing things because they have these internal um, internal job promotions and stuff where people are aunties, uncles or whatever and they end up in jobs that they're not skilled for. They don't understand them. That's why I come in and cut budgets because not that I'm stealing money, you know, because one thing local authorities don't like is cost reduction. It's often that they're giving too much to the contractors. I remember, I'm not going to say where, um, but there was this woman that she was taken from being an administrator to becoming a surveyor, they spent her days going around with a contractor. And he would say, oh, this, how much is the garden fencing for replacement? 14,000 pounds. Well, I'd go there and say, no, it's not, it's 3,000. But she'd been writing them off for about eight, nine months before it got flagged to their head office that they needed myself to go and review all their costing models. 
Now, bear in mind, pretty much anything can be done down to minutes. They have a book called Minutes, which was written in, I think, 1975. The prices are all relevant, even though they're out of date, because what you do is you do an uplift on it. So, for example, say you open it up, changing a door handle is six minutes. Price is £8.76. Well, you do an uplift of 25% or 40% even, based on... The, the actual cost of that job and you can get contractors to bid on those prices which means that you can actually specify everything and it works it does work because everything's in that book if you haven't got a book code you can't do the job which means the job cannot be authorized without it and if it's above that book price then it has to be quoted which is a separate job anyway very simple system as you can see now imagine if you started pushing this to where a ledger system identifies where things are right and wrong. So when somebody puts in that they had 10 garage doors, yet you know there's only five garages there, where did the other five garages go? The, the five doors go? It's 2,000 pounds that's disappeared. A lot of stuff does. Gets stolen. Gets written off by contract managers and whatever, and picked up by their brother, the buddies or whatever, for house renovations. There's a lot of corruption that goes on, and it's not just from that side. Contractors, as I said, will uplift the cost of a kitchen, for example, from 3000 to 12000 and pocket the difference. Um, that is a very common thing, where the guy that's signing it off will be getting a little brown envelope. All this stuff, just on the local authorities alone, would save taxpayers millions. Now, if you get into the realms of Carillion, I identified a lot of these problems in Carillion before the big collapse, and they did try to blackmail me on this stuff. Um, so one of the things I did with that is, A, I keep all my documents, which is why they've never chased me, because I'll, I'll just make them all a bit of a Wikipedia's moment. Um, but the, sorry, a WikiLeaks moment, or Wikipedia, yeah, either way. Um, because I recognize all the issues, that's what I specialize in. And this is why I'm thinking of spending a bit of time getting the software written. Now, the money involved in this is phenomenal, which is why I'm bringing this up now, because if there's anybody that's fit for purpose, and I'll say fit for purpose, because if you can't code this stuff, do not get in touch with me. I get bugged by people telling me, can you help me do this? And it's like, no, I can't. I haven't got the time. Um, but I want to say that what they really mean is, can I do it? And then they just use my idea and use all the effort I put in to ride on the back of it. Well, the answer to that is no. But this, this venture is absolutely phenomenally huge. Um, the ledger technology is one side. If you actually add it into its sensor, sensors as well. So for example, an air conditioning unit has got a maintenance due today. Mobile phone has a app that can, be, that can scan that you're in a location. So you scan that aircon. <clears throat> One of the things a lot of people are catching on to now is even though you have no phone signal, the GPS in this still remembers anyway because Google's still on that info deck, left, right, and center. But you can scan it and say, yes, I was there. That logs it to the ledger. But also, there's a sensor inside the air conditioning unit that recognizes the filters are removed or the covers off. It could be in the BMS system, doesn't matter. That could be a second trigger to say it has been maintained. Third trigger would be confirmation that it, they've invoiced. And at that point, the managing company could simply go, got three triggers here. He was on site, cover was opened, invoices arrived. And you could automate it for that payment. Or you could automate it for uh, auditing. Because one of the things that you're getting these days in things like Carillion, uh, well, used to be Carillion, is they don't have a budget for auditing. They haven't, they rely purely on the invoice coming in. I was sat in RBS Bank with over a quarter of a million pounds worth of invoices sat at my desk. When I said to the contractor, have you had any of your invoices paid? And he says, well, no, not yet. That's like, well, give them to me. Because nobody was actually checking how much it even run up. These are managed contracts. You have a fixed budget every year. You're supposed to know 
pretty much where you are on a daily basis. Um, <clears throat> so what's my point? Using the ledger system, I can pretty much work out how to do all this stuff instantly. I could look on the ledger and I could see that five covers are open. This um, AHU is actually switched offline and has an emergency repair ongoing. And I, I've got a trigger here that said that parts, a purchase order for parts has been requested. Now I could actually then go into that and say, why is it not been authorized yet? Answer, no supplier, okay get somebody in the office to start finding a supplier will help the contractor. The HU's got to be back online by Friday. There is no real systems that work this way yet. They should have done it 10 years ago. But what has been happening is you're getting silo working with these different companies. A contract for one major contract could be worth a quarter of a million to three million pounds for two or three years. The point being is, we get this system up and running, it's literally a license to print money because the competition can't keep up with it. They haven't been. They've been band-aiding old software. <laughs> See, the thing, I have to be very careful what I say because I've got a lot of clients with issues. So I, I, that's why you hear me pause because I, I'm actually removing the, the names of the, <laughs> the clients. Um, but for example, they paid £160,000 for a software upgrade. Um, <clears throat> they installed the software, it crashed, it destroyed all their old data, and then they had to wait eight months for the new updates. And then when they were about to update, they said they found another bug, they're going to do another update. So they were left without any maintenance software for over eight months. Bearing in mind, they paid 160K just for the upgrades. So that's not including the software. The software licensing is separate. I would estimate they spent over a quarter million pounds on something that doesn't even work. Um, and they would have to pay that at least uh, once every two years. So there is phenomenal money to be made in this, especially if it's done in the right way. This is why I want the blockchain technology built into it. I want it to be able to understand the information that's being relayed. Um, to the point that the app is telling you, even if it's a third party, you go to your, um, <clears throat> even a guy is doing the fire alarm system and he's, a, he's only in here for two weeks. He downloads your app, you give him his ID number, he's logged in there because his ID number recognizes his company and who he is, because he's got to have their name as well. It confirms they are the maintenance engineer. And that information is stored in the ledger to say, Joe Blocks maintained this fire alarm system on 2nd of February 2018 and on the 14th of February when there was a fire and nothing went off guess who's responsible that's why I would do all this stuff I would remove all the, the lying conniving stuff I heard today Glenfell fires there's, there's some investigations going on relating to the ones starting the fire the bits you're not hearing is the bits where the people responsible for putting that cladding on the outside they tried to dump it onto the contractor, but as the contractor said, they did warn the council. The council didn't want the cheaper one, and that's what they went with. But who's been made responsible from the council? And I bet you, well, pretty much, slap here, bet you the guy that actually signed off from the council had no idea what he was installing whatsoever. And they will push, we rely on the contractor. Wrong answer. Wrong answer. The answer is they rely on people like me to actually deal with these sort of things. But the problem is I cannot be everywhere. I cannot um, cover all these bases. But with an automated system that we build on this, that interlinks all this information together, which also means that <clears throat> when we get specification for something, we can add it to the system, which means it doesn't matter if you're with a bank, a building society, a social social security office, prisons, whatever. If you tapped in the information related to that specification for a, for a new building, it would already recognize that you can only go to the first floor. It wouldn't let you go any higher. It wouldn't authorize the payments. And you'd have to phone us up and say, well, why can't I get this done? And I say, because you're not legally allowed to. It, that is not fit for purpose. It's the wrong type of cladding. But that's what we want. I don't care. It's actually illegal to install it. Job done. So yeah, that's what I'm thinking at the moment.
And I know it's a bit long-winded, and this is why I don't really talk about this stuff too much, but I know some of you guys have been suffering because I've been talking about the Philippines a lot. Um, <clears throat> but this is why the Philippines will be a little bit delayed. April, I'm already talking about she going back for her visit. Um, she may take the kids, may not. We'll see how that goes. Because um, I know there's already people asking, where the kids, where the kids? <laughs> so, um, But I, we're getting in a position where we could do... A few regular flights a year anyway so I'm not, I'm not too fussed on that at the minute um, we'll see see how things develop but that's this is one of the key elements I'm looking at right now now bear in mind the carbon trust I've mentioned mentioned already and I've got to be honest those guys haven't even responded to my emails and I'll do my video on one of my other channels and then I'll send it to them saying they're so non-responsive um, I'm sure they'll get in touch very quickly especially when I stick it on LinkedIn um, but the, the point is I want to tie in with some of this stuff as well because if I can work out how the carbon footprint stuff is tied to this as well, I can actually do an assessment on uh, reduction of carbon. Why is that important? Because they're pushing it. Anything they push in construction, maintenance or anywhere else is where the money is. You know, there is, <coughs> there is always going to be a cycle. It's a bit like with the asset management. Asset management has had a surge of idiots coming to it. Um, so from my point of view, I, I get the hierarchy in the sense that I have to sit and sift through their garbage. Um, <clears throat> when they fill in reports and stuff, they don't really know what they're collecting and you're trying to identify when they put AHU, do they mean it's actually a air conditioning unit, if they put it down as an air conditioning unit, it's, an air, it's a um, water filter, and all, all sorts of weird stuff. Yeah, I had a oil filter down before when it was a air compressor. I'm not sure how they mixed that one up since it was, it was quite a large, large unit. But anyway, <coughs> point being is you get these cycles <coughs> and the carbon stuff is now a pretty big one. UK is pushing it heavily and the EU is doing the same. And as I said, I was, when I was in the Philippines, they are now picking up on it. And a lot of it is so, we have no idea what we're doing. You know, they're going, we're doing waste separation. And they're trying to move to the next step because the waste separation is the beginning. Um, but you've then got logistics, reducing um, fuel usage, reducing uh, waste generation waste packaging and all this sort of stuff it's all exciting stuff um but i'd like to get all this built into an app which starts with me switching this thing on i've been looking at it and i'm thinking it's gonna be a lot of work but i'm sort of excited to do it and like i said if anybody's actually serious enough to get interested in it um i welcome the help i welcome bringing you on board for it the power plants will still continue anyway we the big thing with power plants is one of these it's one of those entities where you push them in front of a client and then a client goes away, has a thing, and then comes back. The carbon trust stuff, because I've already picked up some clients in the Philippines now that are trying to reduce their carbon footprint, that ties in with this, which is why the power plants even become more uh, useful. If you're, if you're not aware of what I'm talking about, we're actually waste to power in the sense that we take old tires and plastics and turn them into diesel and um, electricity. Now, <clears throat> the point being is there those could be zero cut and very easily <clears throat> due to the fact that your logistics is localized. Instead of having a massive plant somewhere, you have a plant that is built on the side of the hospital. Use the same heat generation for the turbines to pump hot water around the hospital as well, it gives you free heating as well. Um, then you've got the the waste not only coming from the hospital, but also local authorities, which means you're actually getting rid of other people's waste as well. You can charge a fee for it. I believe the tire disposal fee, well, the, tea, the fee in Europe is two pounds, but somebody was on about, it's more than uh, two pounds in the UK. Well, there's half a million tires a year for disposal. That's a lot of money to be picked up on this. And this is a stepping stone because we want to get into waste incinerators and other stuff later. But anyway, nearly 20 minutes in. Just want to throw this one out there because like I said, a few guys have got frustrated with so much Philippine stuff and nothing on business. So I'm throwing this one out there. A lot of people may have actually missed it from the first start of when will I be back in the Philippines. And 
<clears throat> but the point is, I'll know which ones I actually watch all my videos. <laughs> but yeah, business is definitely going ahead, and I'm in that. I'm in that zone now. I've had that week of reset and rebuild. Well, crypto stuff still continuing. If you know the markets yourself, they're fairly stagnant. They're still trading in there, but in all honesty, my portfolio is not really moving that much. So as such, focus on this. <coughs> Do a little bit on the crypto, but this has um, more potential long-term. <coughs> crypto, if I didn't spend any money and just sat on it, it's going to boom anyway. That's the point. I've already got good investments in there. Someone will just suddenly go click and away it goes. Last year was a year of speculation. This year is a year of development. Um, so this year maybe it'll be a lot slower. But the fact is, if you're sitting on $1,000 or something, it suddenly goes to, uh, there was like one cent and it suddenly goes to a dollar. You do the maths yourself. And that's, that's the whole point. I want to try and not touch my crypto that I have. I will trade. Yeah, I've got seven thousand dollars on a trading account, which I'm going to start reutilizing now that I'm back. And I may actually put another socket on here. That's another thing I have to do. You know, the funny thing is, the reason there isn't one on there is because it's wired up here, and I've got to find the cable that goes to there. But I don't really want to disconnect the electrics to find it. <coughs> and I've already had an electric shock off this bird's nest up here. This house is dire for electrics it's um it's a bit like a box of cables that's the way I describe it with some of this installation stuff i would sack somebody who installed this bad i really would I, I mean myself i normally tail everything even if it's just with uh different color um <coughs> different color insulation tapes what i do is i'll pair them so like for example black and black would mean that was the positive and negative of this or whatever you know the fan or whatever so that you can identify what's what because if you open that up you'd have another set of pairs so you could actually know what everything is but here it's terrible the last place everything was on one circuit aircon cooker lighting sockets all on the same thing they literally just gone around the house in one massive loop and just like dropped everything on it <clears throat> Which means when your AEC is having a fit, you can't switch the thing off. Welcome to Spain. Thanks for watching.